Hello and welcome to the True Crime Lounge podcast. This is the sister channel to my YouTube channel, True Crime Lounge. I also have a merch shop and you can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Now, let's dive into today's video as we talk about Megan's Law and Megan Kanker. Now, what exactly is Megan's Law? Well, it is a term that for states that create and maintain a sex offender list that makes information on registered sex offenders available to the public. Federal law also requires convicted offenders. Oh. Whereas the victim is a minor to contact local police um, about changes of address of or its employees employment after release from prison. The extent in which the information is publicly available is determined by the states. This information typically is shared via social media platforms such as pub Facebook, um, public websites and printed materials, So what? So let's talk about the brief history of Megan's Law for a second. Well, the first Megan's Law appeared after the rape and murder of seven-year-old New Jersey resident Megan Kinka, a sex offender by a sex offender who lived in the girl's neighborhood. Soon after the passage of the first Megan's Law, the federal government implemented a requirement that all states' establishments establish sex offenders and sex offender registries and provide the public with information about the registered sex offenders. Prior to Megan's law in 1994, Congress enacted the Jacob Wel Wel Ugh. Wetterling Crimes Against Children and Sexual Sexually Violent Offenders Registration Act. This act states that states can maintain registries of convicted sex offenders and keep track where they live and after they re are released from incarceration. Megan's Law amended this by requiring public notifications. The Weatherling Act was, was named after an 11-year-old boy who was abducted at gunpoint by a masked man in Minnesota. His body was found 27 years later. Although the police weren't able to save him, lawmakers Hope that the law passed in the name and would help others. Sorry, y'all. I hurt my knee a while back and it still hasn't properly healed, especially at the kneecap, so it hurts, <laughs> especially today. Um, but so Megan's Law in, in every state. So while Megan's state, whilst each state virgins, a Megan's Law slightly differs. They all require some form of all sex offender registration and community notification. The information that states typically to collect sex offender includes the by offender's name, address, picture, and nature of crime. States publish this information on a freely available website that the public can query um, in many ways. So, who was Megan Kanka? Well, Megan was a Megan Ka Megan was raped and murdered July 1994 when she was only 7 years old. She lived across the street from her family. Unbeknownst to Kanka, this neighborhood had past convictions for a sex offense against <coughs> against two other little girls. Following Megan's death, her parents and others advocated for laws to ensure that people would be notified when a sex offender moved into their community. This became known as Megan's Law. So what exactly happened? Well, on July 29, 19, 1994, seven-year-old Megan Kanka disappeared from her neighborhood in Hamilton County, New Jersey. Well, Hamilton Township, New Jersey. 
A search um, began after her parents found her abandoned by their front lawn. They were aided by several neighbors, including Jets, Jesse K. Timodakis, 33, who lived across the street from Kinkas. As people continued to look for Megan, someone alerted the police that Joseph F. Cefeli, who lived with the who lived with Tamadakas and owned a house owned by Cefali's father, mother. So in 1976, Cefali had been charged with. So this is why that's important. Um, so in 1976, Cefali had been charged with crim, with carnal abuse and sodomy of a five year old, and he was convicted. Of three lesser offenses, police learned about Cefali, <coughs> Cefali and Brian R.J., another roommate who was convicted, um, who was also a sex of, convicted sex offender, and had alibis. Um, Tim Adekas, <coughs> I know I'm probably butchering up, and I'm terrible at names, and I apologize. Who had been convicted on of uh, two separate sexual attacks on young girls in New Jersey did not. Investigators found <clears throat> cut up strips and cloth in, on government bins um, Tim Agakas had handled, while Megan, Megan's mother recognized the material from her shorts um, her daughter had been wor- wearing. <clears throat> when interviewed by the police, Tim Agakas mm, initially denied the crime, but eventually admitted that he killed Megan. Um... He directed authorities to where he left her body in corpse. Um, Megan's body was found July 30th, 1994. That was two years before I was born. Um, anyway, over the course of multiple interviews, he told detectives that he invited Megan into his house to see a new puppy. Once inside, he slapped her before sexually assaulting her. He then he admitted that he strangled her to keep her from telling his mother her mother, that he touched her. He shared that he had been watching Megan play while living across the street. He had, he, as he did so, he said, I will get sweaty palms and a heart will race. Sick. Um, so, the criminal in the neighborhood in the October 1979, before murdering Kanga, he assaulted a five-year-old girl that, um, and he, who he had asked to help look for ducks with him. Following the attack, he agreed to pl- and pled guilty to attempted aggravated sexual assault. He was offered a chance of a suspended sentence and no jail time if he went to counseling. When he did not attend counseling, he, he attended spending time, um, spending, he ended up spending nine months in Middlesex County Adult Correctional Center. So, in 1989, after being released, he enticed a seven-year-old girl to walk into a near, nearby woods with him talking about firecrackers. He attacked her and choked her and then left his victim when he tur- she turned blue. <clears throat> the girl was unconscious, when her mother found, but alive when her mom found her. So, he ended up pleading guilty and to attempted sexual contact and attempting to cross a se- to attempting to cause serious bodily injury. The maximum sentence for these charges was ten years. The judge, who called Tim and Dacus a compulsive, repetitive sexual offender who constitutes a danger to the public at large to young children in particular, imposed a full sentence. He went on to an adult diagnostic and treatment center in Avenel, New Jersey, where sexual offenders were treated. While there, he reportedly did not engage in therapy sessions. He did meet his two future roommates, Jenin and Cefeli. As of standard at the time, he was released uh, less than seven years into his sentence. So, after Kanka's death, Learning of the predatory criminal history that devastated her family and others, Catherine Marsh, a prosecutor and specialist in child abuse and sexual assault cases, tell A and E True True Crime the community was outraged that they had not been aware of this information. So the creation of Megan's Law, well, 
Though her parents, Richard and Maureen Kanka, had lived in Hamilton Township for 16 years, they had no idea that a convicted sex offender lived so close. They said if they had known that they would have let their daughter play outside without supervision, they would not have let, if they had known, they wouldn't have let her play outside without their supervision. I wouldn't have either. Um, so soon after Megan's death, the Kankas had believed, had begun to press for the law and mandate community, community notification if a sex offender moved into a neighborhood. New Jersey's version of Megan's law was signed by governor at the end of October 1994, just months after Megan's death. So the Kankas continued to advocate for other states to pass their own version of Megan's law. Um, according to Richard Kanker in 1995, he said, We all said that alone that no law is going to prevent every sexual assault on children. But if it saves one child, it will be worth it. Maureen Kanker said in 1996, I have no problems opening my heart and crying and being personal with strangers, as long as I can open somebody's eyes. So, on May 17, 1996, two, uh, two months before I was born, um, President Bill Clinton was signed, signed a federal version of Megan's Law. Those states could set their own parameters for notifications. The law required all states to have some registry available for the public so people could know when a sex offender moved in. Laura Erhern, an attorney and the executive director of Crime Victims Center, tells A&E True Crime Megan's Law gave an opportunity for people in the community to be made aware of those individuals so that they could take necessary precautions to protect themselves and their children from these offenders. So, let's jump into what happened at the trial. Well, Tim Adakis lived with two convicted, as I said earlier, he lived with two convicted sex offenders across from the victim. He had lured the girl, he had lured her into his house by offering to show a puppy. After raping her, he slammed her head into a dresser, put two plastic bags overhead and strangled her there with a belt. He moved her body into his trunk, assaulting her by one, once again before placing her body into a wooden toy chest and dumping her at nearby Mercer County Park. <clears throat> the next day, he confessed to investigators. Sorry, guys. So the next day, he confessed to investigators and led police to the site. Evidence including bloodstains, bloodstains, hair, fiber samples, as well as a bite mark from Megan Kanker's teeth on Tim Agaka's hand led to him being found guilty of kidnapping, four counts of aggravated sexual assault, and two counts of felony murder. Um, in the course of, in the course of a felony. So one month after the murder, the New Jersey attorney. New Jersey General Assembly passed a series of the state bill that proposed Paul Kramer would be would require sex offen sex offender registration that would post by and this would allow this would require sex offenders to registration with a database tracked tracked by the state community community notifications of Register a sex offender move into a neighborhood in life in prison without a chance of parole for those of a convicted of a sex, second sexual assault. So Kramer expressed incredibly after controversy that created by the bill, saying that Megan Megan Kanker would be alive today if the bill had pr proposed had been law. So, Congressman Dick Zimmerman, I believe he is exactly the kind of predator. This is what Congressman Dick Zimmerman said. I believe he is the exactly the kind of predator that the legislature had in mind when enacted the death penalty. So, what they did? Well, the court sentenced Tim Adakis to deaths. Um, 
and the sentence was upheld in New Jersey Supreme Court by New Jersey Supreme Court on appeal. So he remained on New Jersey's death row until December 17, 2007. When the New Jersey legislature abolished the death penalty, the ban resulted in his, his sentence being commuted to life in prison without parole. So, as of 2010, he is incarcerated at the New Jersey State Prison um, in Trenton. But, what about the facts on this case? Well, we know July 29th, 1994, she, was, she lived across from her parents in Hamilton Township, diagonally across from the defendant. So about 5.30, the defendant lured Meg into his house, wanting to play with, a, with the offer of seeing a puppy. So he drew her to his bedroom where he attempted to, sexu where he attempted to sexually assault her. She screamed and tried to escape the defendant, fearing the detection he would not leave. Megan fought for her life as the defendant strangled her um, and the, strangled her with a belt until she lost consciousness. During the struggle, Megan's mom hit Megan hit her face on the dresser and her, hit her head against the door, causing bleeding. To avoid blood stains on the carpet, defendant placed a bag over her head. Defendant then sexually assaulted Megan, believing to be dead. Defendant placed her body in a toy box and carried it downstairs. So when he put it in a toy in the when he put the box in a truck, he thought he heard Megan call. He drove to Mercer County Park, took Megan's body out of the box to a tall into a place with tall weeds. Before he left, he sexually assaulted her again. This is just sick, right here. Really, it really is. So, Megan's family called the police when they when she did not return. So officers arrived and joined the neighbors and searched for Megan. Defendant participated in the search, handling other flyers um, with Megan Megan's picture. Defendant told the police that he had seen Megan riding a bicycle at 2:30 in the afternoon. The statement conflicted with his prior statement to Maureen Kanker that what well, that he last saw Megan before dinner. Hmm. Interesting. So police asked the defendant if he has seen Meg if he has seen Megan at any time other time. He said that he saw Megan riding a bicycle in front of his home between five thirty and six o'clock. The police obtained consent to of the homeowner's defendant's roommate to search the defendant's headquarters. So police questioned the defendant. Again, in the house, shaking and perspiring defendant and said that he saw Megan and a friend between 5 and 5.30 while he was watching his boat. The police had then interviewed the defendant at the police station where he gave conflicting statements concerning his whereabouts during the time of Megan's disappearance soon thereafter, but he was released. So the next day at police headquarters, defendant told the police that Megan was dead and that he had left his body at Mercer County Park. He did so prompting the roommate after repeatedly denying his involvement. So the defendant led, led the police to the body on the drive back to the police station where he recounted what had happened. I have no clue what just happened. Sorry, my computer did something weird. So the defendant did not testify or present witnesses on his behalf at the guilt phase of the trial, which was held on May 5th to May 30th, 1997. So the penalty phase of the trial was commenced on June 9th and continued to June 20th. 1997. So, Kel, a forensic social worker, testified that the defendant's mother, a promiscuous alcoholic who had ten children by seven different men, the defendant's father had a violent, was a violent drinker in criminal history. 
The state presented two rebuttal witnesses, two detectives, So, so in his allocations, the defendant said, Okay, I'm sorry for what I've done to Megan. I pray for her and her family every day. I had to live what I have to live with this and what I've done for the rest of my life. I ask you to let me live so I so someday I can understand and have an understanding why something like this could happen. Thanks. Okay. After that first time, this is just a sociopath right here, to me, honestly. So what about the impact of Megan's Law? Well, according to RAIN, which is a wonderful organization, by the way, um, according to RAIN, cases of child sexual abuse, 59% of perpetrators are acquaintances of the victims, while 34% are family members. Understanding who is present in a child's life, including neighbors, is important in to keeping children safe. Given the majority of child se- of uh, given the majority of a child sexual abuse cases are committed by someone a child knows, a family member, coach, neighbor, children, we can protect more children. Osborne also believes that Megan's law helped people. Open eyes to a widespread societal problem. Megan's law um, and sexual re- and registration started the process of people becoming aware of child sexual abuse and by seeing sex offenders in the community. <laughs> Megan's killer is currently serving a life sentence. Although he originally was sentenced to death, that changed when New Jersey eliminated the death penalty. So, what are some of the expansions on Megan's Law? Well, it was preceded by Jacob Wetterling Crimes Against Children and Sexually Violent Offenders Act in 1994, which he called Registries of Convicted Sex Offenders, but did not require notifications, community notifications. Megan's Law was followed by other laws to protect children, like the Federal Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act of 2006, to which I did talk about Adam Walsh, y'all can go check that one out. Title one of the Act and Sex Offender Registry Notifications Act, the Sex Offender Registry Notification Act, SORNA, and the Adam Walsh Supplemented Expanded Megan's Law, Marsh explains. So, further, these acts helped establish un- uniformity across the states in which registration requirements, such as the length of time, Someone could should be on the registry and how known the individuals to register. So, as of, on February 8, 2016, the International Megan's Law to Prevent Child Exploitation and Other Sexual Crimes through advanced notifications of traveling sex offenders was signed in law by President Barack Obama. So, refer to the International Megan's Law. It orders... Re- Register sex offenders to report international travel plans to departure. A notice of conviction of sex offenders against a child is now included in the offender's passport. Megan's Law and other laws call for sex offender registries and community notifications and have been challenged in court. Opponents have said the laws violate the civil liberties of sexual sex offenders Post challenges rehabilitation consist of second punishment for the crime. However, Megan's law and its successors remain in effect. Alright, so my thoughts on this is wow. Like, how do you t- how? Why? Like, do you think something should have been done beforehand to prevent this? Or what? I'm curious. Let me know. Um that is it for today's episode. I will see y'all next time.